Well, we will consider our ongoing abstract analysis of potential related to charge parallel plates. And here they are. And so we have two plates with plus and minus charge, respectively, and it produces an E field. And we have a coordinate Y here, vertical. We're going to put a test charge between the plates. Now B is going to be like our reference position, just kind of like with our gravitational analogy. <clears throat> so at B, the potential energy, electric potential energy in this case, which is also going to be the voltage, is zero. Now the fact that V is equal to zero at that location doesn't mean there's no charge on the plates. Doesn't mean there's no Q. There can be a Q, or it can also be an E field. But we're not talking about a potential difference yet. We're just talking about a reference position for the potential to be zero. Now, as in the gravitational analogy, the potential in the vertical direction, Q, E, Y. In other words, force, there's the force times the distance. This is ultimately joules. This particular position, V, Y, is ui over q0 by definition so if you take this which is ui and divide it by q0 the q0 goes away and we have e times y so volts is e field times y which is consistent with our idea of the potential being the integral of the electric field yes so that's vy minus vb and it's independent of the value of vb in particular it's a difference in position so VB just kind of represents our reference point for zero potential. Now, VA minus VB equals E times D. It's kind of a general statement. The A now is all the way on the other side. So the potential of A with respect to B is what that means. A is at a higher potential than B is. And the amount is the E field magnitude times d so now the e then is vab over d which we already knew electric field is difference in potential over distance volts per meter but that simple result which really was easy to get to is just true for uniform e fields so the e field is constant we don't have to worry about a complex integral for instance now we also knew that the e field is from a charged conductor, sigma over epsilon zero. Actually, to clarify, between two parallel plates, we have the E field from the plus and from the minus, kind of adding together so that we have, instead of sigma over two epsilon zero, it's just sigma over epsilon zero. So we generalized that earlier too to say that any charged conductor with surface charge density sigma has an electric field equal to sigma over epsilon zero. Now this result is not as useful as this one, volts over d, because this sigma is not something you can just easily measure. But we can easily measure the voltage. How do you measure the voltage? You get out your trusty voltmeter and bring it between the two plates and actually just stick it on there and read it. So voltmeters electronic device that can easily read the potential difference between two different points. So having these two results for the E field, we can solve for the surface charge density as follows. We have sigma over epsilon zero is VAB over D. And so sigma is VAB epsilon zero over D. So it looks a little abstract, but it makes sense that the surface charge density is related directly to the voltage with a constant d and epsilon zero you know relates to the electric field existing so if we how do you increase the voltage well you can increase the electric field how do you increase the electric field increase the charge on the plates so that would increase sigma if we have a certain voltage and want to say cut d in half well if you cut d in half that says that this is double well, it's double because if the voltage is still the same, that means the electric field across this region, the electric field is double what it was before to get this same voltage. 
And then to make the electric field double, we need to double the surface charge density. All right, let's move on. Let's now consider finding the potential difference from a long line of charge, an infinite line of charge. So here we have some radius from that long line of charge. And as we know, it produces a, an electric field that's radially out from that line. Now let's consider two points, RA, and also another point at RB. And what we're going to do is consider the potential difference. So as we traverse the region of space between these points, there should be a potential difference. Why? Because we're moving through an electric field, and anytime we do that, we have a difference in potential. We derive the electric field, we got the following result, lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0 r. And if you don't know where that comes from, then put a cylindrical Gaussian surface around this line of charge of finite length L and solve for the electric field. That's what you get. So now VAB, the potential of A with respect to B, is the integral of E dot DL. In general, that's true. All kinds of weird noises going on around here. I got the fire going and things popping and clicking. Well, not on fire yet, so that's good. Okay. Uh, integral of E dot DL. So that's since E is constant. Let me just call it E. And DL is DR. So, fantastic. Now, VAB is the constant, lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0, integral of 1 over RDR from where? RA to RB. Doesn't matter how these are spaced horizontally. All that matters is the radial distance from one to the other. Well, the integral of 1 over R is ln of R. So there's the constant times natural log of R from RA to RB. That's the constant times 1 minus the other, ln b r b minus ln r a, which is the ratio. So a constant times ln of r b over r a. So that's the result we get for the potential difference between those two points, which comes fundamentally from the idea that that potential difference is integrating the E field across that region of space. So if vb is equal to 0 at infinity, which is how we set up the sphere potential at the, at the surface of a, of a sphere. The potential is what it is with respect to infinity. Then we have the following situation if we try and do that for this infinite long line of charge. Realize this is an infinite distribution. The sphere of charge is a finite distribution. And it's going to make a big difference. See what happens. VAB, well, is VA minus VB, but VB is zero, so it would just be VA. And then that's equal to the constant ln of, well, infinity over RA. Well, natural log of infinity, if you have a finite RA, you know what that is. It's infinite. So this is the result that we're going to get for any ra that's a finite distance from the line of charge so anywhere in space any reasonable place in space looking at the potential at va would give us infinite now that's a really nasty situation one which we really have to admit doesn't give us any useful information we do not like infinities popping into our equations of physics so let's figure out what we're going to do with that so why does that infinity pop up? Well, let's check it out without getting too intricate with it. Consider what Q is here. Well, Q is lambda L, but what's L? L is infinity for an infinite line of charge. So some finite linear charge density times infinity. Infinity coulombs. So we're infinitely far away. That's the RB equal to infinity from an infinite amount of charge. And double infinities do not like each other, and they cause mathematical results to sometimes spew out nonsense, which is, tends to happen when we try and merge quantum mechanics and general relativity to understand the true nature of a singularity, but that's another story. Well, to overcome the difficulty, 
calling it a difficulty. It's not really that hard to deal with. Let's just set v is equal to zero, not at infinity, but some finite location r zero. So here's what that looks like. We have our line of charge. There's our a, and there's our zero. Where is it? Well, you see where it is. It's right there. It's some arbitrary r of zero. Yeah. So that's where v is equal to zero. Then potential difference va minus v zero which is zero is just va but we're going to call that v because remember when we talk about potential it's always with respect to something it's really always a potential difference and so we're just going to call it v knowing that the position where that potential is that value is at the position of interest which is va with respect to the reference position, which is going to be the location R0. So that's the constant times natural log of R0 over R. So there's an equation that pretty much summarizes the potential in space at a location in space from an infinite line of charge at location R. And of course, the value of this is going to change based on what our reference position is as well. So this is a fairly abstract formula, isn't used directly in this manner all too often. We will more often use what comes below, what comes right now, namely a long conducting charge cylinder, there it is, of radius cap r. And so that equation that we just wrote holds for this as long as little r is bigger than big R. So here's little r. So what's the potential way out there? Well, it's going to be this equation as long as this is beyond the extent of the cylinder diameter. Then it's logical to make the choice of r0 for this thing. I bet you could guess. Hmm, I wonder what it would be. That's right, it's just big R. Let's choose r0 equal to big R. And then the equation becomes... There it is, lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0, natural long of the radius of the cylinder over the position, the radial position in question. So inside the cylinder, V is equal to E, which is equal to 0. Now you know that E is equal to 0 because it's a conductor, All right? so it has to be. V is equal to 0 because it's 0 at the surface based on our definition, it's 0 at big R. And since there's no E field inside, when we integrate the E field inside, we get no change. No change means zero stays zero. And it's really what we call an equipotential surface, which I'll get to pretty soon again. All right, let's finish this example by graphing the electric field and the potential for the infinite line of charge and the cylinder of charge. So starting with the infinite line. We have the electric field. We've done it before. It's equal to lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0 r. So it's an inverse r relationship and looks kind of like this. Pretty simple. How about the potential? When we integrate the E field, we come up with a formula. Constant natural log of r0 over r. So notice I'm putting on here r0. Well, when r is r0, this is 1. And you know what the natural log of 1 is. So we've got it, the potential being proportional to that natural log. And it's equal to 0 at r0. And then it continues down from there. So here's what it looks like. There's the potential. In like manner, the conducting cylinder of charge, we have really essentially the same considerations, except the E field in the conductor itself is forced to be 0. It is necessary. And then, there's the value. Notice that value is the same as this. This little r becomes big R. And so it's proportional to 1 over r at that point, and there it goes. For the potential, since we chose big R to be the point of zero potential, and since this is no electric field, no change in potential, we have that the potential is actually zero from zero to r based on our choice. Followed by 
proportional to natural log of big R over R, so that looks the same as the for the line of charge after that point. So that's a, a good introduction to some of these ideas relating E field and electric potential with a couple of charge distributions.